So let's, let's delve in a little bit into this parable today. Um, we've all been there. We've all seen someone sitting with a sign saying, we'll work for food or homeless. I'm a vet, I need help. Maybe we've seen someone by the side of the road and we've slowed our car down or it's been at a traffic light and we've rolled down the window to give them some spare change or maybe let them know where the nearest shelter is. Some people keep some things for the homeless in their cars so they can give on these kind of occasions. Or maybe we're over by the sliding doors at Whole Foods and there's somebody sitting there with a sign, I'm trying to feed the kids. And maybe we guiltily reach in our pockets to see if we have some cash. And maybe we don't. These days, a lot of us don't carry cash. So we say we're sorry and we keep walking. Or maybe sometimes we even avert our eyes and try not to make eye contact so we won't have to have this interchange because we feel like we've got nothing to give. Will you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The rich man in today's gospel probably could not avoid seeing Lazarus. I, I think the kids did a great job. Sherry tells me she acted this out in, in Godspell quite frequently, which I didn't remember this was in Godspell. But Lazarus has been sitting at his gate for some time. And I'm going to suppose probably the rich man, he was sometimes called divers because that's the Latin word for rich man, I guess. Um, maybe he's even given Lazarus something to eat on occasion, a blanket, some spare change. He probably has even given some food. But he hasn't done much to change Lazarus' situation because Lazarus remains at the gate hoping for a scrap of food from the rich man's table, and the dogs are licking at his oozing wounds, we're told, which I, I understand could have been medicinal in those days, so before we judge the dogs. But Lazarus was untouchable, and the rich man was trying to get on with his life, probably busily involved in business, maybe he even gave to charity, and it must have been unnerving to have Lazarus camped outside of his gate outside his house, day and night. Most of all, the rich man must have wished that Lazarus would just go away. And you can see this desire for the poor of this world to just go away, encoded into our laws. This past summer in the state of Tennessee, being unhoused, was made a felony crime punishable by six years in prison. It is now illegal to camp out in public spaces in Tennessee, whether that's under a highway or in a park. And when we hear about the more humane approach of other states, Colorado has passed a bill providing campuses of tra transitional housing. We realize that some states have reacted with empathy and practical help and other states have taken the approach of punishing the homeless as if this is a status that they chose. But Lazarus did not choose to be covered with sores, to be a leper, to have no way of earning a living, no friends and family to support him when times got rough. He had one hope, and that was eating the scraps that fell from the table of the rich man, taking his leftovers and sustaining a life through that. So things change when the two both die around the same time. This man, we are told, goes to Hades, Lazarus to the bosom of Abraham to be with the angels. And I wanna say right off the bat, in case you were wondering, the point of this parable is not to describe heaven and hell to us or to scare us into caring about other people. This story has its origin in Egyptian mythology, and it may have existed in several cultures. According to Dr. Martin Luther King in his sermon on this parable, which I did read in preparation for my sermon on this parable, Jesus accepted the afterlife as a reality, but never sought to describe it in detail. 
So I need to really think about that to know if I fully accept that, but it makes sense. Or as Reinald Niebuhr wrote, he who seeks to describe the furniture of heaven and the temperature of hell is taking the mystery out of religion and incarcerating it in the walls of illogical logic. So this parable is not a literal description of the hereafter, but a cautionary tale about the here and now. The point of the story is to warn us, to wake us up. Not many of us are in the position of the rich man. Well, some of you might wear purple and feast, I don't know, but in general, we're not the rich man. And I'm pretty sure none of us is in the position of Lazarus. Not many of us are at the extremes. But we might be like the five brothers in the parable. Okay. And there still is a chance for us. We see when the rich man ends up in Hades, his regret is very clear. But I didn't know, he seems to say. What do you mean? <laughs> if I had known, I would have done better. <laughs> And his display of ignorance of his own privilege continues as he's consumed by these flames in hell. The rich man asks Abraham to send Lazarus down to Hades to give him a sip of water. So this guy is like uber privileged. And he also wants Lazarus to be his errand boy and go back and warn his five brothers about what happens after death. Maybe if someone comes back from the dead, they'll change their ways. And this is probably a later insertion by the author of Luke, alluding to Jesus himself. But Abraham is firm. These things cannot happen. A great chasm has been fixed between you and us. And we cannot cross this chasm. So what can we learn from this parable for our own lives? How do, how do we wake up? I'm going to tell a couple stories of, well, true stories. Albert Schweitzer, some of, who knows about Albert Schweitzer? There's one, there's one aspect of a story that I didn't know. He was a trained theologian and musician at the turn of the century, for those who aren't as familiar, and he was a brilliant scholar and a charismatic reform minister in Germany. The way I know him most is he published a book called The Quest for the Historical Jesus in 1906, but we're still reading it today. And his whole thesis was, we didn't really understand Jesus. Jesus was this apocalyptic preacher, but we want to make him something else. Mm. Because that's what we'd like him to be, someone who told stories and taught us how to live better. Uh, but without getting into all that too much, at the age of 30, Schweitzer decided to change professions and enter medical school. And he wrote that this very parable of the rich man and Lazarus was the reason he changed professions. He had this kind of awakening. He saw Europe as the rich man and Africa as Lazarus. He realized that Europe had medical knowledge it took for granted while Africa suffered from illness and pain with no doctors to help, like Lazarus. He changed his whole life and decided to spread the gospel by example of Christian labor and healing rather than preaching, even though he had been a gifted preacher. And Schweitzer ended up building a hospital in what is now the Gabonese Republic and remained in Africa for the rest of his life, treating and operating on thousands of people. Schweitzer noted, no one can describe the injustice and cruelties that in the course of centuries, the Africans have suffered at the hands of the Europeans. If the book were written, it would be too horrible to read. This parable woke Schweitzer up to something he could do in the here and now. So that was 1906. More recently, in 2005, William McCaskill was a student at Cambridge when he first heard about contemporary philosopher Peter Singer. Do you all know about Peter Singer? Maybe a little bit less. Singer had written an essay about the famine in Bangladesh back in the 1970s when he gave the thought experiment. 
So think about this. If you stroll by a child drowning in a shallow pond, presumably you don't worry too much about soiling your clothes before you wade in to help. So say this child is across the world. Does it matter? You would still want to save this child. So devoting resources, this is Peter Singer's thought, devoting resources to superfluous goods is tantamount to allowing a child to drown for the sake of a dry cleaner's bill. In other words, our money could be saving lives, yet we spend it on unnecessary things, according to Peter Singer, which begs the question, what is necessary, what is unnecessary? But William McCaskill, after hearing this story uh, from Peter Singer, the philosopher, when he was at Cambridge, decided to devote his life to this cause of effective altruism. And effective altruism is all about finding the most effective ways to alleviate suffering on Earth using technology and data analysis to decide how and when to use money to help others. So William McCaskill is now a professor at Oxford, and he lives off just a small portion of his salary, and he gives the rest of it away, but in the sort of effective altruistic way. And this is what he felt moved to do. This is the path that woke him up and led him to change. So these examples can leave the rest of us feeling a little bit inadequate, <laughs> like we can never do enough to help others or be as good as an Albert Schweitzer or a William McCaskill. And this is true. We can never do enough. And our faith teaches us that no matter how much we do, we cannot earn a place in heaven. No one measures up completely to the ideal of goodness and generosity. And no matter how giving we become, there is always more that we could give. Our faith teaches us that Jesus is the one that opens the gate to eternal life to us through forgiveness and compassion. So this morning, the point of this parable is not to overwhelm us. Let's remember that we don't have to meet the Lazarus at every gate, only the Lazarus at our own gate. Each of us is called to see who is at our gate. Gates can divide us, gates can keep out the unwanted, but gates can also be entries. They are meant to be opened. And there is something in each of us that can be opened today by this parable. The question is, how will we use our privilege, our position, our money, our education, our time, our talents, our individual gifts to alleviate the suffering just outside the fences that we construct around our lives? Now, many of you are doing something to help others. Some of you are working on big questions. Why are there so many in need in our country in the first place? You are voting and studying policies, trying to make systemic change. Some of us are sponsoring a child or helping a local family or working with refugees or the disabled. Karen Claypool sponsors a whole village. <laughs> we do these specific things because they have called to us. We do what has occurred to us to do, what has come into our path, what the Spirit has nudged us to do. This morning, we have a parable that shows us life is about caring for one another. We are fully on notice so we don't end up like the rich man, completely ignorant of life's true purpose. We are called to embody the compassion that Jesus showed us. To see Lazarus at the gate is to recognize our call to love and heal a hurting world to notice who is at our gate and what their presence means. Maybe Lazarus at your gate is a friend in need of a listening ear whom you keep meaning to call, but you never get around to it. Maybe Lazarus at your gate is a project you keep putting off, one that could have enormous benefits if you would only begin. And maybe Lazarus at your gate is a neglected issue in your own health 
or the health of someone you love, a follow-up that needs your attention, but you keep delaying that doctor's appointment. Where do you need to reach out with care? What needs attending to that is close by, yet overlooked in your life? And we could ask the same thing for our church. Who is Lazarus at the gate for this church? Maybe Lazarus is right across the street at the Glenwood Community Center. Maybe Lazarus is down the street at Orchard Knob Elementary School that the pilgrims have often helped thanks to the leadership of Margaret Davis. And maybe Lazarus is over at the Restoration Village for the homeless being built by Help Right Here, the organization that we collected coats for last winter. So I wanna invite you to something this morning. I'm not a Baptist preacher, y'all know that. I don't even know how to say come on down. But I do wanna say step right up this morning. I, I'm gonna channel some inner Baptist because we are still looking for a leader for our mission and outreach commission at this church. Remember, you don't have to be a member to be a leader of a commission. Uh, Joe, if I'm violating the rules, let me know later. I think Joe and Margaret are on Zoom this morning. So we need someone to lead our Mission and Outreach Commission. And if you think that person might be you, then I'm going to say it probably is you <laughs> and see me after church. Because we get to ask some exciting questions. We have this congregation. We have this body of Christ. We are stronger together. So what will we do together to alleviate the suffering outside the walls of this church? There are organizations that we can partner with. We don't have to do it all. We just have to start doing it. There are people around us that we don't always see. Lazarus was at the gate for St. Andrew's Church in Martha's Vineyard a couple of weeks ago when 50 human beings seeking asylum from heartbreaking violence and poverty in Venezuela were flown from Texas to the island off Massachusetts by the governor of Florida. And guess what? The church responded with food, a place to stay, and the warmth of human fellowship, the recognition that these were human beings in need of love and welcome. The church and the community cared and they took action. And as we begin to open our eyes and to see, we move from awareness of the issues around us, of the people in need around us, to action. Later on in this service, we're going to sing an old hymn. I hope most of you know it, or at least the tune, God Will Take Care of You. But I suggest another way to look at this is God acting through us. We will take care of one another. Mother Teresa once wrote, I used to pray that God would feed the hungry or do this and that. But now I pray that he will guide me to do whatever I'm supposed to do, what I can do. I used to pray for answers, but now I'm praying for strength. I used to believe that prayer changes things, but now I know that prayer changes us and we change things. Each of us is called to something different to heal this hurting world, to recognize the needs in different places. The one that is in front of us, just outside our gate, is usually the best place for us to start. May God be with us as we are moved from awareness to action. Amen.